thevolnewpodcast.com. What about the Lightning Network off-grid? Is it possible? Yeah, it, it's possible. We, we actually um, have a guy uh, working with us this summer who's, who's got that as their, as their project. And probably in the next few weeks, hopefully, we'll announce some sort of very early version of that. Uh, using something called loop in, so it's not it's not strictly communicating with lightning over the mesh, but it's it's a it's just an example of how an off grid computer uh, or an off grid Bitcoin node could actually participate with the with, with the lightning network. Um, kind of from a high level, you can I can describe what we're doing. It, it, we're sort of attacking the problem of of using lightning payments to incentivize people to use mesh networks, but from two directions. So one direction is to take Bitcoin as it as it is now. Um, the first project we did was this project called TX Tenna, and what that did in a very simple way was it it you took um, so you have a mobile phone that was that is not connected to the internet, but it's running a mobile Bitcoin wallet. Um, and this was actually uh, a tool created by the Samurai uh, Samurai Wallet guys. I, I don't know if you've ever talked to them, but they'd be they'd be great to have on your show. Actually, they're Tomorrow, living the, living the dream. <laughs> Tomorrow, um, actually. <laughs> oh, that's right. No, yep. I saw that. Oh, yeah. No, they, those guys are great. So, so you can ask them about TX Tennis too. Um, but so they they um, built. They were already building tools to allow for alternative communication um, systems for um, sending Bitcoin transactions. So they they had a, a way to do it over like a ham radio, off a of SMS. Um, they even had a ideas for like sort of message in a bottle almost ways of, of sending Bitcoin transactions. <laughs> uh, great stuff. So um, so we, we worked with them to adapt what they had done, um, what they call mule, their Mule Tools project. We worked with them to adapt that um, to allow you to send um, over the mesh network, over the GoTenna mesh device. So that was called TX Tenna. Um, and then the next version of that, so that was on a mobile phone. And the next version of that was, in the, uh, was to take the same protocol um, but instead of running it over a mobile phone, have it run on a single board or any sort of PC with a USB port. So you can take the GoTenna radio, plug it into a USB port, and do the same thing. So this was called mm. TX10 a Python. Uh, and that, that has some some interesting, you know, for one thing, it's a little easier to develop on a, on a single board computer, like a Raspberry Pi or something. That's, that's what you can think of. So very low power usage, very low cost, um, and you just plug in a Gotenna to um, be able to now send Bitcoin transactions over the mesh. You're listening to the Vanu Podcast, the podcast making you invulnerable to the coercion of the state and the servile society. Visit our website for free resources to aid you in your pursuit of self-liberation. Old Vanu publications, podcasts, guest articles, and much more. Go to vanupodcast.com. And now your hosts, Shane and Jason. And welcome to the Vanu Podcast, the podcast making you invulnerable to coercion. I'm your host, Shane. This podcast, everything found on the website, is covered by BIPCOPS, no government license. It allows reuse and modification to anyone except for governments and the agents thereof. So one quick announcement uh, before I get into uh, before we get into this uh, discussion tonight. Uh, last night, August 4th, I launched the Vanu Live Forum uh, at the suggestion of a listener. Uh, I thought it was a great idea, so I made it happen. Uh, this forum is dedicated to discussion on self-liberation and is basically just a uh, censorship-free zone where we can strategize and learn from each other. Uh, Subforums include networking, mobility, perpetual traveling, crypto anarchy, and much more. Uh, and yeah, you should definitely join. Uh, join. Just visit vonniepodcast.com slash forum, click register, ship me an email, and tell me that you joined, and uh, I'll get you a password uh, generated. Uh, just visit vonniepodcast.com slash forum, and my email address is shane at libertyunderattack.com, and I uh, hope to see you there. Uh, so on June 19th of last year, 2018, Kyle and I had Brian Sovereign on uh, to discuss mesh networking. Uh, definitely check that out if you haven't. Uh, it was episode number 47. Well, on today's episode, number 61 of the main podcast feed, uh, and another in our Crypto Anarchism series, we're going to revisit the subject today with my guest, Richard Myers. Uh, he is a decentralization engineer at Global Mesh Labs uh, and Gotenna. Uh, you know, we've talked about Gotenna quite a few times on this podcast uh, before. Uh, and uh, he's also the co-founder of Bytabit AB, a peer-to-peer privacy-focused Bitcoin exchange. Uh, so we'll dig into his various projects, uh, his background, uh, Bitcoin and mesh networking, and uh, much more. So Richard, welcome to the Vani Podcast, sir. Uh, how are you doing today? 
Great. Thanks, Shane. Looking forward to talking today. Right on. So uh, when we were, when we were uh, chatting yesterday, you uh, you said that she listened to a couple episodes of the podcast. So um, I don't recall how much I went into uh, went went into it on those episodes. But just out of curiosity, uh, what do you think of uh, Vanu as a, a freedom strategy uh, or philosophy uh, from what you've heard so far? Yeah, um, I, I I was very inspired by a Smuggler's uh, episode. That's the first one I listened to, and I what I liked about it was I this sort of this idea of rather than sort of separating yourself from society sort of existing within, I guess, what you'd call the first realm. Uh, but I, and I, and I actually have picked up the, the book or the, the ebook, but I admit I haven't had time to go through it all, but I'm very intrigued by these ideas. Uh, so, uh, and it, it certainly, it, it goes well with mesh, you know, and, and a lot of the reasons people use mesh. So I think uh, it certainly, certainly hit a chord there. Right, right. Awesome. Well, that's uh, that's that's great to hear. So, so first off, um, uh, why don't you start by uh, introducing yourself? Uh, who are you, and uh, what do you do? Yeah. So, uh, my name is uh, Richard Myers, and I work for uh, Gotenna, but I actually work for a sort of a organization that has been spun out from Gotenna called Global Mesh Labs. Uh, I'm a software developer. I've been doing that for 20 years or so. Uh, and just in the last year, went to go work for Gotenna, um, basically to pursue um, uh, it's something I'll get into a little bit later, but it's basically how do we incentivize people to use mesh networks uh, and taking inspiration from Bitcoin and, uh, you know, the cryptocurrencies generally. So, yeah, so that's that's what I do at Gotenna. And it's been a lot of fun, got to tell you. <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah, I know I've seen... Uh... Um, I've seen a number of things. Uh, I think over the over the past couple of years, I think I think I've seen like with the wildfires out in uh, California that TX10, like uh, you know TX10 has actually been out there with you know providing mesh networks for communications. So um, it's uh, it's it's great to see that um, you know the uh, pe- people are seeing the utility of it. Um, and because uh, uh, I, I don't know, I, but before a couple of years ago, I really didn't know anything about mesh networking. So um, now that I do, it seems like I'm seeing it all over the place. Uh, so that's uh, that's that's certainly a good thing. So I guess uh, where where do you consider yourself uh, ideologically? I mean. Uh, anarchist, libertarian, uh, uh, cypherpunk, uh, etc. <laughs> yeah, I mean, of course, nobody wants to label themselves, but but I would say I certainly identify with uh, both the cypherpunk movement and and their goals, uh, as well as just the basic agris philosophies. Um, you know, through my lifetime, I've I've probably called myself a libertarian at some point, or or a um, you know freedom person. You know, but I would say. <laughs> right. Uh, my, my, my evolution is definitely more towards, more towards the, the agorist viewpoint, uh, and, and, um, more and more kind of coming to realize that seems to be the right approach. Um, and I think technology is in, in support of that. I mean, it's, it's great. I, I can't say I've been sort of aware of the cypherpunk movement for, for its existence, but have always been sort of curious about that stuff and, and always had sort of a, without sort of knowing it was going on. Um, been been attracted to those concepts. I mean, I read 2600 magazine when I was in college and thought, you know, all that stuff was pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I, I'd say this has been just sort of something I've, I've been doing my whole life. My, you know, ph- ph- philosophy probably comes mostly from my family, which, you know, my father had was a subscriber of the Objectivist newsletters when I was growing up, and of course I didn't know mm-hmm. what those were then. But now, you know, in my in my older age here, I understand that. It's sort of a it's a family thing, you know. It's it's a, a movement that actually goes back quite far. Uh, oh, so yeah, that's yeah, really definitely. cool. Definitely philosophically, I, I would say uh, well aligned. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's 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 uh, really cool to hear. So I, I'm just curious, and, and yeah, you can share as much or as little as you want to, obviously. Um, but uh, you said you've been a software developer for 20 years. Um, I guess uh, um, what uh, what sort of things have you worked on in the past? Uh, what's your uh, what's your expertise? Uh, could you speak to that? Yeah. Um, so I, I've done a lot of different things. Um, for the largest, like largest, longest job I had was what you would call like scientific programming. So C plus plus is is what I've been working on for my career. Scientific programming was for a company that made scientific microscopes. So that's the bulk of the time. Um, but I've also worked for game companies. I, I did, I guess, almost three years at uh, a game company, a large, a large label game company. Hmm. Um, so I think those are probably the, the bulk. I, I had a six-month uh, stint with a financial firm. I, I didn't like it, so I left to, to make computer games. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so that's uh, but but pretty much you know programming my whole life and uh, 
and uh, and I'm really happy though in the last year. I mean, I really I did like my job with the scientific uh, microscopes, but uh, when I had an opportunity to apply, you know, my my interest in Bitcoin and, and cryptocurrency to mesh networks, I uh, I didn't have to hesitate long to take that opportunity. <laughs> Yeah, you have to. <clears throat> you have to. Like it, when when you when your when your passions can over you know over overlap with uh, with with uh, you know finance you know financials. That's uh, that's certainly a good thing. Um, <laughs> certainly a good thing. Um, so I guess yep. uh, so, so I guess um, let's let's go ahead and get into uh, into mesh networking here um, because uh, yeah I, I I love the subject I I, I, I do so um, I guess let, let's start with and, and and we did talk about it a year ago as I said um, but. Uh, we do have uh, quite a few quite a few new listeners, and uh, I always like to start with definitions on this podcast. Um, so, I guess uh, could you start by defining what a mesh network is, and uh, also explain how it uh, differs from the internet uh, as most people know it? Yeah, good question. Um, so, first of all, it's Im- important to sort of contrast what a mesh network is versus what we have now for communication. Uh, and and in the case of Gotenna, well, so first of all, what is a mesh network? So. Um, you know, a centralized network, it's my computer or my phone or whatever connecting to some central relay or base station or ISP or, or autonomous system. And, and, that, and then that centralized whatever will then connect in a, in a point-to-point way to get your data or packet or whatever uh, to its destination. Uh, that's what we're – that's the phone system. That's the Internet. That's, that's when you talk to Comcast. That's how that works. Um, what a mesh network is, is more of a bottom-up type of communication. So what it means is um, if I have a mobile phone and I connect and I want to connect, you know, to somebody, what I do is I first connect to somebody who I connect to somebody in the path to that person who's near me. And then my message is going to go from, from me to somebody um, who's within my range of, or like within range of, say, my radio. And then it'll hop from their radio to the next person and so on, from person to person until it arrives at its destination. I mean, that's the essence of a, of a mesh network is, is this hopping from person to person. So what it means is instead of being just a consumer of connectivity and a consumer of bandwidth, you're actually also a supplier of connectivity and bandwidth, um, which, it's, which has been an attractive option, you know, an attractive idea, I think, for people for, for many years, for probably 15, 20 years. I, I'm sure people have been sort of talking about how this is, uh, you know, a, a, an attractive idea. Sure. Um, but um, but it but it does suffer for some problems, which I can talk about a little bit later, which is what we're trying to solve um, with incentives. But but it's also good to also say, like, kind of what Gotenna does versus some other mesh networks you might have heard of. Sure. Um, for instance, there is something that is um, community they call a community internet or community mesh internet. Um, and what those are is that's when you put like a satellite or, or you put like a, a Wi-Fi antenna on your house and you, you, it's like a fixed antenna and it points to somebody else's house and you can build a community network that way. And there's a few good projects doing that. Um, and that's, th- those are very interesting. Those are still mesh networks. Um, uh, but what we look at at Gotenna is actually a, sort of one step more, which is actually mobile omnidirectional antennas and allowing people to connect without a sort of fixed even fixed antennas. So think of it like, uh, you know, walking around with your mobile phone. In our case, mobile phones, for various reasons, can't talk to each other. And that's not because of technology. That's not because you couldn't do it on a mobile phone. It's Mm -hmm. really because the people who make mobile phones and the carriers who they sell mobile phones for, you know, they have no financial incentive to allow people to communicate person to person in a P2P way. Sure. Um, but so what Gotenna had to do is basically we, we were really a protocol company, but we had to create a device so that we could actually, um, you know, let people experience mesh networking and, and make that something people could do. And um, so what the Gotenna is, is a small, you know, it's like the size of a, a lighter or something, uh, a little bigger than that maybe. Um, and it pairs with your mobile phone and it basically gives you a, a radio transceiver that you can use to communicate over long distances uh, with, with other people. So it uses the, the, the UHF radio spectrum, which is a unlicensed spectrum. So that's sort of unique. You know, the whole spectrum is divvied up by the government in different ways. And, and the UHF spectrum that we use for the Gotenna is one of those that is actually kind of 
it's unlicensed, so anybody can use it, and also it doesn't have restrictions. Um, so, for instance, some ham radio stations, you can't encrypt or you can't do meshing, um, hmm. or you have to have a license if it's a ham radio. So, so what what Cotenda does is make this device that allows people to basically mesh mesh the you know, do mesh communication uh, over pretty long distance. Something like you know the current, and this is true for anybody on UHF. It's a, it's going to be around four miles. If you've got clear line of sight, it can be much mm-hmm. longer, shorter if you're in a city. Um, does that, uh, does that give you enough background, I think, hopefully? Sure, sure, yeah. And I guess a couple of questions popped to mind. Uh, now, you, you mentioned, uh, and I and I saw this, uh, one, uh, someone reached out to me and had an interesting idea for, it was kind of, a, I, I guess, a, a tribute to Ray. He, Rayo, talk, Rayo, the main proponent of Ani, talked about encrypted ham radio nets. Um, that's as far as he went um, into, mm-hmm. I guess, mesh networking. Um, but someone was like, you know, like, we should have, like, like we should do something like that involves ham radios. And I was like, I don't know, we all look into it and see. <laughs> And you have to have a license. So I said, yeah, that's not going to work. Um, like, that, that's, that's unfortunate. So, so you're saying that the, the UHF frequencies aren't, um, are unlicensed, or I guess they're, they're unregulated. So, um, <clears throat> so yeah, I think they're still probably regulated. I think that's all regulated, but it's, but it's, it's a more permissive license. It's sort of uh, like your Wi-Fi is, in this, is under the same licensing. So anybody can build a device that uses those frequencies, and they're, they're not, like, limited as to what you can mm. do with them. Okay. So, um, gotcha. So that would be the distinction there. Okay. Gotcha. But, and then, uh, uh, yeah, but it's it is it ahead. is and it's yeah it, it it's it it's one of those things that um you know like you were talking about encryption that that is one of those things that you cannot do over ham station. I'm not a ham, so I don't know all the rules, but I sort of watch the discussion because um we have uh, uh we have some hams in the Bitcoin community and and um you know ham ham enthusiast uh, amateur radio enthusiast. Uh, and recently, actually, I don't know if you, you heard about this, but um, Elaine Ao uh, and uh, let's see, Rodolfo Novak, who, who makes the cold card, they managed to send a Bitcoin transaction or send a Bitcoin value over, I think it was basically from Toronto to Northern California. Um, but they got a lot of flack from the ham radio community thinking that it was encrypted. And, you know, there was, there was a whole story there. Uh, okay. um, so there's just there's, there's a lot of there's a lot of sort of self regulation in that in that realm in that uh, ham radio community. <laughs> sure, sure. So um, so I guess along that same line of thought, um, Piotr on Twitter asked, "Are reg- so?" And I guess this I guess maybe more of a general question: um, Are regulations of frequencies problems with global mesh networks? Yeah, it isn't. Um, there's two two answers to that. Like in the case of Gotenna specifically, the the worldwide regula- regulatory frameworks all have something in about the same frequency. So the radio will auto-tune based on where you are and, and allow you to still use it, you know, pretty much anywhere in the world. Uh, but the second part of that is that um, I think sometimes people imagine mesh having to be like one mesh, like one contiguous mesh. And that, that isn't entirely true. I think the, the more reasonable way to look at mesh networks is sort of a, just like the internet is a, a network of networks, uh, a mesh, a global mesh network would also be a network of networks. So you, you know, you need some way to get over the ocean, some way to get over the mountains, even between cities, if they're far apart, you may not use the same mesh radio technology sort of that you would use within a, within a community to get between communities. So, um, so even if they were different or, you know, different parts of the world were using different frequencies, um, first of all, technology can sort of auto tune, but second of all, um, for different purposes, you, it makes sense to, to use different radio frequencies. Okay. So, okay. yeah, so it's, but it's a good question. Okay, understood, understood. So, so I guess, um, and, and I guess, well, yeah, this was, uh, you know, speaking of problems. What, what are some of the other problems and obstacles with mesh networking? Um, I remember from um, from our conversation with Brian Sovereign, speed was one of the big ones. Um, so, I guess, uh, um, um, could you could could you speak to some uh, to that problem and also other ones? Yeah. Um, so there is a trade off when you're dealing with uh, radio instead of sort of a fiber optic cable, and that's you've got this trade-off between power usage, bandwidth, and range, uh, and it's hard to optimize all of them at the same time. So uh, like in the case of the Gotenna, we, we have a mobile device, so we have to make sure that the power draw is, is low. That's also a regulatory thing. They, they, um, 
they don't let you without on, on an unlicensed uh, device broadcast arbitrary power. But even if they did, you know, you you want to preserve battery power when you're when you're on a mobile device. Um, so I would say, like in in the case of a local mesh, we um, optimize more for range and less for bandwidth and less for and and sort of range and power over bandwidth. So the trade-off, and what that, the reason that's a good trade-off in the case of a mobile mesh is the longer your range, and the, of course the lower your power draw, but, but the longer your range, the fewer other people you need um, to also be participating in the mesh to have a fully connected mesh. Um, one of our, uh, Ram, our, our chief scientist at Gotenna, did some simulations and, you know, just using some some basic uh you know simulation of of the range um i think i I forget exactly what he was using i want to say it was 1.6 kilometers something like that um but you could you could use i think it was something like 25 people in a uh five by five mile area would be enough to have a fully connected mesh you know assuming it was just sort of open open areas um but if you were using wi-fi it was going to be hundreds if not thousands um so, so there's really a, a large um, factor with having high, you know, having having long range as a as a really um, exponential increase or decrease in the number of people mm-hmm. that you need. Um, so, so that's that's one limitation. That's sort of the that's that's a radio limitation basically. Um, I think the other maybe more um, fundamental thing that's held back mesh networking is is more the incentive structure. If you're putting out a, a mobile network, uh, you know you go and raise a few billion dollars. You buy some spectrum. You site your base stations to cover the most population and provide coverage. And then that's how you sort of can kickstart a a system where people can actually talk to each other. Um, you know, because if if you're the only one with a mobile phone, uh, then it's the, what we call the zero start problem. If you're the only one with a phone and there's nobody to call, it's not a very useful phone. Right. Um, and we, we, we have that problem with mesh devices is if you're the only one on a mesh and there's nobody to talk to, nobody to relay your message, then of course it's going to be less useful. And unlike a centralized system where you can just um, kind of bootstrap the system by, by central planning, if you will, you know, sort of bootstrap it by just sort of centrally planning your network and going in and this uh, sort of starting that way. Um, we need some sort of decentralized way to incentivize people to provide coverage and bandwidth for their neighbors, you know, and for people that are nearby. Um, and it's not that, you know, people people are pretty enthusiastic in the GoTenna community, and a lot of people do run their device in their window, and then when they're walking around just to help, you know, just to be part of the network. But but it's not quite enough to do it purely based on altruism. I mean, it's it's you know, you're competing against centralized networks where, where they have a very strong pro- profit motive. Mm-hmm. Um, and to get that same level of c- coverage is, is not going to be easy. So that's why, and, and we can talk about a little bit later, why we're sort of looking at ways to do a decentralized incentivization system uh, based on Bitcoin Lightning Network. Um, so that's, ah. that's, that's how we think we can solve that, that problem. Um, but there, Very interesting. You know, there's other people doing other 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 ways. There's other ways to do it. But I think until you had Bitcoin, you didn't really have a decentralized way to do payments between people uh, without without somebody sort of being in the middle, somebody being the PayPal or the central bank of whatever system it is uh, you happen to be trying to build out. So it's a there's two 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 great technologies that kind of have a nice intersection. I think. Right. Right. So, so I guess, and this is just a, a, a comparison that I, I think I made this last year too. I mean, would, so, so would you say that the infrastructure or I guess the network, the, like the, uh, the mesh networks would be similar to the infrastructure of like the Bitcoin network? It's uh, peer to peer, um, you know, basically traveling from, from node to node. Is it, is it similar in some ways? Yeah, it is, especially in the sense that the, in the Bitcoin network, your peers are anonymous and, and like, um, that's an important part of the network that the peers are anonymous. They don't need to have a reputation. Uh, the internet is also technically decentralized. I mean, people connect from peer to peer. I mean, the, the original design of the internet is 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 to be a, a peer to peer system, but uh, in in practice, it's not. In practice, the, everybody is sort of not. Everybody's there's no anonymity 
involved in the internet. You're people who peer with each other. They do that in a very um, sort of, they know who they're peering with kind of situation. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, And and talking about Bitcoin being decentralized, there's sort of a nice backwards, uh, sort of there's a nice, uh, what I want to say, like, just like we think that Bitcoin and, and the Lightning Network can help us incentivize mesh networks, uh, it sort of flows back in the other way in that even though um, Bitcoin nodes are a peer-to-peer network, they're actually running on centralized infrastructure, uh, which can be a problem. And there's, there are definitely ways to attack the Bitcoin system, uh, the Bitcoin um, network from its connectivity layer. So, f- for instance, if you could, uh, you know, through firewalls, for example, block people communicating, then you could, you know, you can make it hard to, for people to use the Bitcoin system or you can, even worse, you can eclipse people. So there's, there's this idea of if you sort of run, if you run the ISP that's talking to somebody, then you can feed them false data mm. uh, and cause, cause problems out. Um, and there have been examples of people doing this. I mean, uh, can get into that more maybe, but so anyway, there's, there are advantages uh, to, to the Bitcoin network. Uh, network to have alternative communication and especially in our case would be like last mile communication uh, both both from a censorship standpoint but also from a privacy standpoint uh, you know if you're transacting even if you're transacting through tor um, you you still i mean tor tor is a good idea but in places like china for example they just block tor they throttle tor so mm-hmm. it's not an option for everybody but if you're talking if you're sending transactions over a mesh network You've got sort of a layer of physical security in the sense that you're not, there is no, there's no subscriber number tied to your communications anymore. Um, And that can be, you know, that can, that can, I think, help Bitcoin be the sort of decentralized network that it really, that it really is, is trying to be. Sure. And even if it's not your main connection, just having as an alternative connection um, is a, is a powerful thing. I mean, you, I, I don't know if you've talked to anybody about the uh, what Blockstream is doing with their satellite system, uh, but that's another good example of how you can use alternative communications to create a decentralized uh, to decentralize Bitcoin nodes like, and and get get these advantages of privacy and censorship resistance just by using alternative uh, communication layers. Right, right. Yeah, I know Max Hillebrand, Hillebrand brought, uh, brought up uh, the Blockstream satellite. Um, yeah, and I was uh, I was watching something on uh, on Fascist Tube. I don't remember uh, what uh, I don't remember what uh, what video it was, but uh, it was talking about uh, um, like the it's that that's really kind of one of the the only real vulnerabilities of Bitcoin is just the way that the way that everyone connects to the internet, uh, you know, ISPs. Um, because yeah, th- those are censorship resistant as you or those are those are cens- censorship prone as you said. Um, so. That's why, uh, you know, the, the the need for mesh networks may not necessarily be here right now, um, which is why I thought there really wasn't much happening with it. Um, and, uh, yeah, I kind of, uh, when I was talking to Max, I said, um, <laughs> you know, like, I, I, I've thought about this. Like, you know, what about, you know, what about Bitcoin in an off-grid scenario? It, is it going to be useless? Um, it, but it's, it's, it's good to see that other people are thinking about it, too, and there's actually things being built. Um, so... Um, I, I think uh, um, the next question I, I want to ask you is because uh, uh, you mentioned private. You mentioned that uh, you know the I guess the first realm internet, as I call it, um, is uh, you know very uh, not privacy friendly. So um, and, and I think I do know the answer to this question. But would mesh networks be better for privacy then? Yeah, absolutely. I mean that's that's an important aspect of it. Um, and you know the, the the fact is your your um, when you're broadcasting. Over radio, your location, your identity—that's you know—that's that's you've got sort of this physical separation between you and and your identity um, that you just don't have with a wired internet or even a even a like a mobile carrier. I mean, they go to great lengths to put chips and, and identify who you are on your phone. Mm-hmm. So uh, yeah, privacy is a big part of it, and privacy and censorship go kind of hand in hand too, because it's a lot harder to censor somebody if they you know if the People who are trying to do the censoring don't know where or who you know who they are. <laughs> right. <clears throat> so that these are both, you know, under the same under the same uh, under the same. Like, I don't know. Uh, they they work together to be to give you both privacy and censorship. Uh, and and you know, like something like mesh networks too. You know, these these communication channels are encrypted, end to end encrypted. So um, so even even though you know over and above the fact that your sort of identity isn't known 
because you're not connecting through a mobile phone or you're connecting to a, uh, you know, a, a wired internet, um, your, your communications are also encrypted. So anybody listening is not going to know who they're listening to, even if they can uh, try, to, try to monitor that way. Uh, and one, one other way that I think mesh networks are, are you know, they have a little extra, uh, I want to say like extra privacy and extra censorship resistance is they're not really, uh, you know, back to the bandwidth question, you know, we're not optimizing for bandwidth, which means most of the communication is going to be short bursty data. So you're not just sitting there streaming YouTube over your mesh. This is going to be more for sending like an SMS message or a, or a Bitcoin transaction, which I can talk about later. Mm -hmm. You know, these are all in the, in the sort of form of short bursty data. So, uh, and you know, militaries honestly have, have been the, probably the earliest and most wide users of mesh networks. And for, you know, for these reasons, because it's important that they be um, unable to be censored and, and also to maintain privacy. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, so absolutely. That's, that's definitely a big part of it. That's yeah. That's that's uh, definitely good to hear. I, I knew just based off the fact that they're peer to peer, they're going to be a hundred percent better on privacy at least. Um, so <laughs> good to hear. And and the next question, I I guess, uh, <laughs> um, I, and I want to get to the to, to the lightning and Bitcoin, but um, I I have a I, I need to ask this question because I know I know some people are thinking it, um, but. Uh, Basically, uh, so you mentioned some, some numbers, numbers before about how dense um, the number of, I guess, um, I, mesh network nodes need to be um, to create, uh, to, to mm -hmm. supply, you know, connection for 25 people. Um, do you have any idea? I mean, uh, like, um, I guess this might be a tough question because you, you, you said it's, it's a network of networks. Um, but I guess how... Um, how far are we away from, from I guess, an, an actual, you know, functioning alternative internet, um, like, like a mesh network? Yeah, I mean, so I would say if you're just building on the current technology we have today, you know, we really couldn't replace the internet. We're, we're looking at much lower bandwidth, and you know, that's necessary in order to have the to kind of have the range so that you can build out fully connected networks. Um, but there is a, a sort of strategy you could see in here is that you get people. What you what what you want to do is you you want sort of a wedge technology and low bandwidth, short bursty data is we hope a wedge technology that can, starting with, you know, maybe some of the most active communities about around privacy and censorship resistance, you know, start with those communities and, and get this technology used on, on at some scale. Mm -hmm. And then and then let it get wider as, as the, the sort of awareness of it expands. And I think once enough people have, you know, once you have the sort of density of, of users, then you can increase the bandwidth. So, Honestly, if you look at people in their cell phones today, there is enough density. If, if everybody with a cell phone was part of the mesh network, oh gosh, yeah. um, the hurdle is really just getting, just yeah, just the hurdle is just to get that into your cell phone, to get that technology to be part of your cell phone. Um, so you could see that you know these centralized cell phone operators have have done a great job of seeding the world with you know tr radio transceivers. Um, they just have for their own you know their own reasons not made that a sort of haven't sort of flipped the switch and made that possible. So, so one answer to your question is we're pretty far away with, with the current sort of uh, what's currently available for mesh radios. But, but you could also say we're, we're not very far away if you were able to harness sort of the devices people have in their pockets right now, uh, then, then, you know, it's, then it doesn't really become a hardware issue. It becomes more a routing algorithm issue. Uh, and right. that, I, that's really where Gotenna, I think, has been doing most of our innovation. I mean, is coming up with these uh, routing protocols that can handle large mesh networks and, and can do it with very little overhead. That's, that's typically been a problem is, um, you know, when you've got a lot of people in a mesh network, you, you would like to leave as much of that bandwidth available for communication and not use it all just for control packets. So this idea of like a zero control uh, routing protocols is that's i would say that's really what gotenna is more is is that is our specialization and sort of our focus um, protocols generally but uh but like i said before we we have hardware because we need hardware to demonstrate that this works sure and uh and, and nobody else was doing it so we are you know we are we are both hardware and protocols um same time i guess great to hear so, it, yeah so, hopefully so, so there's, there's room for optimism there's room for optimism but uh we, we don't know sort of there's a few steps missing as far as how we how we enable that 
that future. Right, right. Well, it's uh, you guys are kind of pioneering the field, so that's uh, you know, that's that's expected. That's expected, um, and it's it's great to see. So now for um, you know, we, we've mentioned it probably a dozen times by now. Um, but uh, you know, question I have my outline. What what about the Lightning Network off grid? Um, so I guess we can tackle. Um, I guess yeah, I, I guess we, we can tackle that one first, and then just kind of segue that into, um, I guess into into your your projects and, and what you guys are working on working on with incentivizing uh, people to I guess run mesh, mesh network nodes or whatever. So I guess. Uh, what about the Lightning Network off-grid? Is it possible? Yeah, it, it's possible. We, we actually um, have a guy uh, working with us this summer who's, who's got that as their, as their project. And probably in the next few weeks, hopefully, we'll announce some sort of very early version of that uh, using something called loop-in. So it's not, it's not strictly communicating with Lightning over the mesh, but it's, it's, a, it's just an example of how an off-grid computer uh, or an off-grid Bitcoin node could actually participate with the with, with the Lightning Network. Um, kind of from a high level, you can I can describe what we're doing. It, we're sort of attacking the problem of of using Lightning payments to incentivize people to use mesh networks, but from two directions. So one direction is to take Bitcoin as it as it is now. Um, the first project we did was this project called TX Tenna, and what that did in a very simple way was it it it, it took um, so you have a mobile phone that was that is not connected to the internet, but it's running a mobile Bitcoin wallet. Um, and this was actually uh, a tool created by the Samurai uh, Samurai Wallet guys. I, I don't know if you've ever talked to them, but they'd be they'd be great to have on your show. Actually, they're, tomorrow, they're living the living tom- the dream. <laughs> tomorrow, um, actually. <laughs> oh, that's right. No, yep. I saw that. Oh, yeah. No, they, those guys are great. So, so you can ask them about TX Tennis too. Um, but so they they. Um, Build, they were already building tools to allow for alternative communication um, systems for um, sending Bitcoin transactions. So they, they had a, a way to do it over like a ham radio, off a SMS. Um, they even had uh, ideas for like sort of message in a bottle almost ways of, of sending Bitcoin transactions. <laughs> uh, great stuff. So um, so we, we worked with them to adapt what they had done um, what they call mule, their Mule Tools project, we work with them to adapt that um, to allow you to send um, over the mesh network, over the GoTenna mesh device. So that was called TX Tenna. Um, and then the next version of that, so that was on a mobile phone, and the next version of that was, in a, uh, was to take the same protocol, um, but instead of running it over a mobile phone, have it run on a single board or any sort of PC with a USB port. So you can take the GoTenna radio, plug it into a USB port, and do the same thing. So this was called hmm. TX10 a Python, uh, and that that has some some interesting. You know, for one thing, it's a little easier to develop on a on a single board computer, like a Raspberry Pi or something. That's that's what you can think of. So very low power usage, very low cost, um, and you just plug in a GoTenna to um, be able to now send Bitcoin transactions over the mesh. Hmm. Well, um, so based so based on that framework, you thought, hmm, you know. If you're really thinking about an off-grid system, an off-grid phone, so a mobile phone is not going to be a full load. It, it could be running a, a wallet, but it, it's some objects, but it's, it's a little more difficult to run a full node. Um, but what if, what if you really want to run a Bitcoin full node, be a sort of a sovereign node on the on the on the network? Um, so going back to what Blockstream had done, they have this satellite system. So what we what we did is we worked with Blockstream, um, and um, they basically were able to uh, we were able to integrate this TX10 product so that you could connect your TX10 your off grid TX10 um, Python node to a Blockstream BlockSat enabled Bitcoin node, which means that wow. what that really means is that your your yeah so your off grid node is now receiving block information so it's able to basically confirm transactions um, without having any internet connection at, at all and what the mesh allows you to do is not just receive so by by receiving blockchain information that means you can confirm payments that's essentially what it means so now if somebody sent you a transaction you you're going to receive the blockchain and know that it that it's sort of money good but what you couldn't do with that system is send a transaction without somehow getting on the internet um, well, that's where that's where TX10 of Python came in, because now if you were on a mesh network over the mesh, you could send 
your Bitcoin transaction. And it would hop from node to node to node until it got to some wired internet, you know, somebody with internet. Um, and then, and then that could then get relayed onto the internet. So, so that was a cool project. We, we announced that just in May, actually, uh, at the MCCC, the Magical Crypto Conference here in New York. Um, and that, yeah, so that, that, you know, that was a, that was getting us closer to what we're after. Um, but, but, but there was sort of one more step there. I'm just sort of taking you in our evolution. Sure, sure. Um, so the next step, uh, and this, this is a, this is especially cool for your, your listeners who really want to maintain an off grid presence. Um, not only can you receive blockchain data from a saddle, from the block sat, from the blockstream block sat, but they also have this thing called the API data interface. So what that means is anybody on the internet can send a message through the Blockstream satellite on a separate channel, and it goes to the whole world. And um, what's more, they allow you to pay for that with the Lightning Network, so you can pay for that sending of a message completely anonymously. Wow. And it's rather cheap, if I remember right. Um, so anybody can connect, you know, connect over Tor if you want, and pay with the Lightning Network and just send a random message. And, and apparently there are people out there um, sending news, just news, just summarizing the news for different areas and anonymously sending that all over the world. And so that, and so that, what that means is anybody with a, a low cost computer and a hundred dollars worth of equipment for the satellite receiver can totally in an uncensored way receive, um, yeah, receive outside information. Wow. Um, which is great. Yeah. So that's, you know, so that's that's starting to get closer to what we're after on a mesh network. So you can see this now. You're seeing somebody paying with the Lightning Network in order to communicate. This would be sort of like communicating over those long hops. If you wanted to communicate something over the ocean, over the mountains, connecting net mesh networks, um, the BlockSat, you know, that's definitely one way to do it. That would be that would be an interesting approach. Um, so, but we asked ourselves, there's there's sort of a piece missing. Our our hypothetical like off-grid system that's receiving blockchain information and API data can use the mesh to broadcast at their community. Um, but what we really want to do is you, we would really also like to be able to send information the other direct uh, to send it out information from your off-grid network. And that's, um, that's what Will is working on this summer is being able to pay a lightning invoice so that your block sat message that you want to send to the world can be paid for with your off-grid network using light using lightning. <clears throat> so hopefully, hopefully at the end of the summer we'll have uh, sort of the beginning of that, and then we'll probably evolve that over the next few months to be a full, uh, not just a uh, a loop-in system, but an actual full what they would call HTLC type communication uh, with the lightning network. Right. Um, yeah. So that's so that's coming from the Bitcoin side of things, and then. Um, and, and where we're, we're trying to evolve that is, is just using this. This is just using the current Lightning Network and the current existing mesh technology to enable this ecosystem of sending both Bitcoin on-chain, but also Lightning payment, uh, payment channel communication, you know, over the mesh network. And this is, this is all possible because both Bitcoin transactions and these um, Lightning channel updates are, are pretty small. I mean, we're talking about maybe three or four or, or perhaps even less um, SMS messages. It's something like that. You know, it's maybe a thousand bytes at most um, for, for we, we believe we can do it like that. I mean, the, the, it's a little bit different than the current um, Lightning Network. If you were a full node on the Lightning Network, you have a lot of gossip messages and there's a lot of other information that we wouldn't, we wouldn't be part of that. Um, but for just the straight payment part of it, not the network maintenance part of it. You can do it quite in a quite like bandwidth economical way, um, and and it's a, a good way to show off both sort of how how data efficient Bitcoin is, as well as how that meshes well with a very low bandwidth uh, mesh, long range mesh network. Um, but then uh, I was going to say the other part of the project is um, just like you can incentivize. Uh, the block set to send your API data all over the world, um, we would like to be able to, do, in a similar way, incentivize mesh nodes to also relay data for people within range, um, which is, so that, that's our incentivization protocol. And that's uh, what we call Lot 49. 
which is a uh, sort of a project. We have a white paper out there, um, but it's essentially just describing ways to take the Lightning Protocol and um, make it more, even more data efficient than it is now, so that we can get even squeeze even more data into these updates. Um, and and that again, it's just building. It's really not a it's not a different Lightning network. It's not a different token or anything like that. It's just it's a Lightning network node. But we're the nice thing about the Lightning network um, as a layer two network. You've got a lot more um, leverage for nodes. They don't all have to necessarily speak the same wire protocol to be able to communicate value between themselves. So what Lot Forty Nine. Is, is just a different, uh, in the lightning terms, it'd be like a different feature. So instead of communicating over the internet with high bandwidth, they can communicate over the mesh network. And and what, so one of your links in the lightning network can be a mesh node or two mesh nodes communicating. And, they, and if those two are, you know, if, the, if at either end of your mesh communication, you might get back on the internet, your, your uh, message can continue to then travel through the traditional, I guess, first realm internet. Um, so technologies yeah, so just feed off each other. Idea. Yeah, hmm. I, awesome. I think so. And you know, I, I think it's worth mentioning, too, that why this, why this is, works in Bitcoin is because Bitcoin has this real focus for um, minimal, minimal um, requirements of um, uh, bandwidth, hardware usage. You know, it's, it's, not a, it's a system that recognizes that for a technology to be decentralized, its resource usage also has to be minimal. And that, that plays well with Mesh, which has some of these same constraints as far as minimal bandwidth, minimal power usage, um, and just trying, you know, to be as distributed as possible, everybody should be able to run a node. So um, there's actually a, there's another team working on a, a related project um, doing sort of what we're trying to do with, with Lot 49, but they're doing it over a different radio technology and they're doing it in Venezuela on very low cost, uh, the low raw radios. So in, in, our, in our mind, this, these technologies can basically all talk together. Um, you know, they'll all basically be speaking the same, same value transfer protocol, which would be lightning. Um, and then, you know, you pick the radio, you, whether it's satellite communication or mesh, mesh radio communication or, or um, even high frequency radio, you know, which is even lower bandwidth than mesh radio. These things can all can they can all talk together. I mean, they they can't talk over the same radio, but they can all um, be part of the same network. And what ties them together is that they're all receiving their incentives sort of in the same unit, which is uh, which is Bitcoin. Sure. So hopefully, yeah, hopefully that gives you some idea of the the grand vision of of how we go from these sort of local networks to more of a, a global network of uh, of mesh devices and people right yeah it's uh it's it's incredible i'm just so i'm just sitting over here listening um because like i i i had a feeling i mean it, it kind of seemed like last year's conversation um like you know this stuff like the the routing alg algorithms you know the stuff that we need is it's basically all here for mesh networking it just comes to um comes to market to, comes to market demand um but it seems like there's uh yeah there, there's a lot more happening um at least uh, at least you know at least um in the in the past year i think um so I don't know. Uh, Bitcoin and uh, Lightning off grid and off grid scenarios. Uh, that's 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 great. And uh, I mentioned in pre show that uh, you know this is this is the question that's going to get put into a or this is the answer that's going to get put into a into a YouTube video because um, I uh, in my in my uh, I guess in the past few years um, I've, uh, I've I've been you know I've uh, followed Bitcoin and one of the questions I've always gotten from constitutional constitutionalists and patriots um, kind of the survivalist off grid types is well if, if if there's a grid down scenario Bitcoin's useless so how would how, or is, is it useless you know how, how would that work? And I didn't have a question, or I didn't really have an answer. Um, you know, from from the past few uh, interviews uh, in the crypto anarchism series, I've gotten more of an answer. But I've got a, a guy with uh, that, with a lot of mesh networking experience, so we're going to get that uh, knocked out here. So, um, <clears throat> so so uh, Richard, could you walk us through how a Bitcoin transaction would happen in an off grid scenario? Or I guess that seems like there might be a couple possibilities. Um, and yeah, please feel free to go in detail. Uh, this is yeah. So this is a, a question that I'm often asked. So um, yeah, take it. Go for it. <laughs> Okay, so let's say you have an off-grid system, or you're, you, you have to have power, so you're running some sort of a computer. Uh, what I would recommend is that you get a, a connection, you get a, a, block, a block stream, block sat receiver. That would allow you to download 
the uh, blockchain and, and be able to receive payments because now if you receive payments, you can confirm them with the data that comes off the block set. Uh, and then for sending transactions, and assuming you want to be private, um, there's sort of two ways to do that. Um, I would say um, uh, if you are in an area where you are near civilization or you're near, you know, you can basically um, relay transactions to the to a community that has uh, internet connection, then using a mesh network is good because you can, or if you're if you're in a community that is all mesh, that is has a mesh network running, you can send your transactions that way. And, and that would be enough to communicate. So if you're only exchanging transactions between people um, within a, a local mesh network, um, that would be, you know, that, that would get you part of the way, but you still eventually need to get your transaction confirmed on the global internet. So you do need some sort of a link either through a, a local wired internet connection somewhere like a gateway from your mesh network, or uh, if you were very far off grid, you know, you might have a satellite system or even a high, high frequency radio. I think that would be for the true off grid person, um, you know, building out a network of these high frequency radio receivers and, and, and transmitters um, would probably make the most sense as a way to um, transmit and but basically to get your your payment transactions um, off and then and have them be received over national borders um, you know without without um, without constraints so yeah I would say that the ultimate system is probably going to be either mesh or high frequency radio for sending transactions and then something like the block set for receiving them um, yeah I think that's that's it Perfect. and and if you're and if you're Doing lightning transactions, that the same applies. I think you can also do lightning transactions using the same same basic technologies. Sure, sure. Okay, yeah, fantastic. That uh, that's 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 good to hear. It's, it's a pretty pretty. Yep. Yeah, I mean, it, it's not uh, it's not super complex, really. Um, it's not. Um, it's just you know data data being transferred, eventually hitting a relay to the to the main internet. So, um, very cool, very cool. Right. So. Um, I guess um, there's uh, one other uh, one other project that sure. Well, I, I guess I'll ask you this: uh, Is there? Are, do you have any other uh, any other thoughts on uh, mesh networking? Um, I guess. Uh, um, yeah. Any? Um, I guess overall uh, general thoughts on uh, mesh networking or any of your work with with uh, GoTenna or uh, TXTenna? Uh, yeah. I mean, I guess I get into the. I, I, I don't know how technical you want to get into things, but uh, you know, I think I gave you the the basic rundown. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, that's the that's the basic rundown, uh, you know, and 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 I think, I, yeah, like I said before, we you know we have we have we have it we have a device that does it over long range, but still the goal I think is to get this to be a ubiquitous technology, and that's that's really what we're trying to overcome. And I think by there's two advantages to using Bitcoin. One is it's it's the right technology for a decentralized incentive system, so that every relay gets a little bit of incentive um, in Bitcoin, but I think it's also a community, uh, just like your constitutionalist community, who has an appreciation for the value of being part of a ground-up communication system, a people-powered communication system, and not a centralized and censorable communication system. So part of making these systems work is to identify communities that have a, a need and are willing to overcome maybe what other people might, you know, who, if you have a mobile phone in your hand, you're not going to necessarily think about using a mesh. But if you if you don't have that option, then you're more likely to be able to you know see the value and 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 take make the effort to get it going. And I think you know you have to start somewhere. And the, these seed communities, I think, are how mesh networks ends up growing into a more competitive uh, alternative to centralized networks. Right. Right. Yeah, very good, very good. So, um, yeah, Richard, please please do make sure. Um, I know you you mentioned a white paper. I'll put the, I'll put all the links that are in your uh, Twitter bio into the show notes. But yeah, please make sure to get me anything uh, you want me to toss in the show notes, um, and I'll uh, I'll drop them in there sure. so my, my listeners can follow up on that. Um, so I guess the yeah the other uh, project the other thing I saw mentioned and mentioned in your bio and I hadn't heard of it before um, is uh, Bytebit uh, AB. Um, so you got uh, I guess a little Bitcoin exchange. Uh, so why don't you tell us a bit about that? <laughs> Yeah, this is actually this is the first project I worked on before I went to work for GoTenna. So I've been working on this for quite a while um, with uh, with my brother. Actually, he's doing actually most of the work at this point because uh, I'm busy with Mesh. But uh, but so what, what, 
the basic idea behind um, Bytebit is that you know another attack vector for Bitcoin and for decentralized you know commerce are these centralized exchanges where most people mm-hmm. buy and sell Bitcoin. And they're easily shut downable. Even the one that was um, probably the best for people who wanted to stay anonymous and was uh, local bitcoins out of Finland. And I think in the last year now they've they've done two things. They've they've stopped allowing people to trade person to person with their system, um, so they don't they don't allow in person trading. And they also have like mandatory KYC now, mm-hmm. so uh, know your customer identification. So um, that's basically taken away one of the best. Um, systems for people who wanted to trade Bitcoin peer-to-peer without a centralized exchange. And this is important in a lot of places, but especially in, in, in the less developed countries where maybe people don't even have ID, um, it really it really limits the, the ability for people to become part of the Bitcoin ecosystem. So what we, and, and there are other projects that are also thinking along these same lines. There's a couple I'll mention. Um, one is called BISC. Uh, I know those guys and they're, they're doing good work. Uh, another one is Hoddle Hoddle, which is a little more recent, but they're also they've got a great uh, system out of Lat- uh, Latvia. Um, but what we what we didn't see in the market was a mobile only system for doing peer to peer Bitcoin trading. So and and in a the key is that it's non custodial, not just that it's peer to peer, but it's non custodial. So what that means is that we, as the marketplace, are more like a Craigslist of of people who for people who want to trade. We're not actually holding anybody's money, anybody's Bitcoin or cash. That's done peer-to-peer between the traders. What we are is just a marketplace so people can get matched up, a matchmaker mm-hmm. for people who want to trade anonymously. So with that in mind, our focus is really on privacy. It's it's the idea that, you know, obviously your order is, your, your offer is going to be public, but um, whether you actually, how much you trade and whether you actually trade with somebody, um, that's information that not only we, we don't we don't want to ask about, um, we want to make we want to design our system so that we actually technically can't even know, uh, and that fortunately the Bitcoin blockchain makes this possible. So, um, yeah, so so Byte a bit basically allows you to place an offer when and when two people are matched, um, they the one who's selling the Bitcoin would escrow their Bitcoin in a two of three multi sig account, two or three multi sig transaction on the internet uh, on the on the Bitcoin blockchain. Sorry, mm-hmm. um, and then. They're gonna and they're gonna then at that point, outside of Bytebit, they'll exchange information about how to make the fiat payment. So assuming somebody's buying Bitcoin with fiat, um, and then if the transfer is a success, if if the seller of the Bitcoin receives the fiat, um, then they will push a button and release that two of three multi sig because it only takes the buyer and the seller to release that escrow, mm-hmm. and then the uh, then the buyer will receive their Bitcoin. Um, the reason there's a third address is, for some reason, it could either be um, could it could just be a kind of a customer support issue. Um, somebody typed the wrong digit, so it didn't go through, or it could be somebody trying to cheat the other party. Um, you need to have an arbitrator. So, so the mm-hmm. arbitrator would then, in that case, get involved and just try to determine in a, in a private way which trader made the mistake or which trader was sort of not being being completely honest, um, and. Uh, but but the key is that whether that trade goes if the trade goes through successfully, um, from both the blockchain standpoint and from the Bytebit standpoint, we have no idea that it even happened, and it, you know we're are, we're making it as as sort of anonymous as possible so that when people do these trades, um, they they um, they they pretty much wouldn't leave any sort of footprint unless they unless they app happen to arbitrate because then. You do see the transaction with a two or three arbitration mm, uh, right. would show up a little bit differently, um, but yeah, but that's the general idea. And, and by going on mobile, we just want to make it something that you don't have to have a desktop PC to use. We want to make it so that anybody, even on a low end smart uh, low end smartphone, at some point, um, people could could trade either person to person or or um, or remotely um, using whatever whatever you know their local currency or their lo- local fiat transfer systems are and um yeah so that's bite of it we're we're starting in sweden because because uh, that's where i live and and it seem maybe seems like an odd choice but swedes are very advanced um in using mobile technology for payments because the government is trying to do away with cash so it, right. it sets the groundwork for people who are who are very comfortable doing you know and they have a lot of good sort of non 
um, non-chargebackable ways for people to pay each other person to person. So uh, I think it's a good place to get started for us. But that's 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 just still in testnet, so this isn't something you can do today. But we hope in a couple of weeks we'll have a testnet alpha or beta out on the on the Play Store that people can play with and and uh, start getting feedback and try to make this the, the tool people want to use. And and just one other thing about that, just in you know this isn't something we're going to roll out right away, but we're also envisioning a system where it wouldn't just be for people to trade sort of um, with with the public. It would also be a place so people could trade with their communities. So you can basically be you could be your sort of neighborhood Bitcoin trader. Uh -huh. And you can have a whitelist of your neighbors, friends and neighbors. And I think that's something that goes on now, um, but there aren't any good tools to sort of service that. Uh, like it would be, the term would be sort of a whitelisted group. So you, you have a whitelisted group of either people you've traded with in the past, or maybe people you know, or friends of friends. And um, by having allowing people to basically build these communities that they can set offers for that community separate from maybe their general public community, um, you create a system that also... Um, I think builds builds the Bitcoin um, builds builds the Bitcoin community of of people um, outside of more of these more centralized exchanges, which you know have a lot of problems. So it creates a more resilient trading trading environment, I think. Right, and it makes it makes it more secure too, because you're you're going off of a circle of you're you're going off of uh, you know that uh, that first and second layer of the circle of trust. So, um, I mean, your 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 guys, I guess the the yeah. task of arbitrators is going to be um, basically not existent if they're working with if they're trading people that they know, and uh, they can feel a lot better right. about their uh, privacy and security. So, um, yeah, that's that that's great. Uh, you know, we need as many of these, uh, I guess. Uh, um, yeah, you know, as many places to buy Bitcoin as possible outside of centralized uh, exchanges, because uh, yeah, that's that's really the only point of regulation. Um, really, really, uh, really, the only point that the government can regulate is the, the on off ramps. So um, I'm uh, definitely definitely glad to to yeah. hear that you guys are working on that. Um, so I actually went and uh, to, to I guess uh, now that we're, we're we're I guess we're getting close to getting closer to wrapping up. Um, I, I actually went and found the quote uh, from Rayo because uh, from 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 us talking and uh, yeah, you were you're talking about uh, how. Using mesh networks for lightning, uh, you know, lightning transactions and Bitcoin transactions. So th this was Rayo's exact quote: Qu uh, uh, "Payment would most likely be in credits transmitted through the net to an underground bank." So that kind of sounds exactly like what uh, we're talking about here. He said that in the late 1960s. So um, I guess he he, wow. he, had, he had the technology. I guess the, I guess maybe the the not even not the technology, just the frequency off. Um, but, uh, yeah, it sounds like <laughs> you kind of nailed the rest. Off, though, really? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's also, it's interesting. It was a lot of, um, yeah, precursoring to this. I think people had this in the, in their head for a long time, but yeah, now, now we just, it just, it just took a while. It took a few, few decades to get it to be possible. Um, sure. But yeah, these, these technologies are definitely all in the same, uh, same direction, which is, more less towards centralization and more towards sort of ground up um, self self sovereign communication is is compatible with self sovereign money. Mm -hmm. I can see that definitely being a something that resonates. Yep, yep. It it, it took uh, you know it took it took quite a few years of uh, you know finally seeing uh, people finally starting to see the the problems with, with uh, centralized systems. But um, yeah, and I've I've said that for for probably a year. So it it seems like things are trending towards decentralization. Even things like Uber, even um, or I guess Uber is still central. Yeah. But you know, like there, there's still those like the the, the ride. ride you could imagine and, a decentralized and things. Yeah, cool. you could imagine a decentralized Uber if you know payments maybe were through Bitcoin. Uh, nobody has successfully done that, but uh, but uh, yeah, you you see a movement in that direction. I think. Uh, yeah. You know, like Uber is an example of that movement. So. Right, and there actually is something called Libre Taxi. It's a it's a bot on the Telegram app. Um, I tried it out where I lived in uh, a, oh. a couple hours north of here, and I tried it out in Austin, Texas too. But I couldn't find. Um, so yeah, basically it just it just um, it's just a bot. You kind of type in like you sign up as a you take thirty seconds to sign in as a driver or as a passenger, and then uh, you know it just you share your location. Um, if you're going to be a driver, and then people around there, it'll you know ping you. Well, I, I guess I presume that's what it did. It never pinged me. And then you just work out payment with the with the person that you're you know working with uh, peer to peer. Bitcoin, yeah. gold, silver, yeah. barter, whatever think, it may be. Yeah, <laughs> I think we're going to see more of that. Absolutely. Um, as as these, and a lot of it's just enabled by technology. It's it's something you could always do, but but technology just makes it more convenient. Um, so that's yeah, that's pretty exciting to hear about. Um, Yep, yeah, I just... think it was interesting. You you mentioned uh, Rayo. I, I don't 
I, I don't think I've, I, I'm familiar with the, the writings, but uh, you're probably also familiar with the sovereign individual, um, Mugri's work. And, and he was speculating about Bitcoin back in the, I want to say, late 90s hmm. um, in very... Uh, yeah, if you're not familiar with that work, I'll send you the link. But um, it's quite quite well known in the Bitcoin community too that um, people had been had been thinking about Bitcoin as a as a alternative payment, uh, non-state payment systems. You know that was it was something that that uh, you know that he explored in this this book because of how it could change sort of the relationship of the state and its citizens. Um, yeah, interesting stuff. I don't think he talked about mesh though, so that that's interesting to hear that somebody was putting that part of the equation <laughs> together too, even earlier. Yeah, yeah, exactly. No, it's um, you know, what one thing I've kind of uh, one thing I've 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 noticed a lot over the past, I guess, couple of years is I've you know immersed myself more and more into I guess crypt, uh, you know crypto anarchy and uh, and open source technology is that um, I there's there's so many projects out there but there's no coordination between bet- between projects people don't know <clears throat> people don't know that they're working on similar things and um, you know like they might have a, pr- a product they might have a piece of software out there but no one knows that it exists um, so it seems like uh, um, and, and this is what uh, uh, keto miner I talked about too um, and I guess. Uh, um, ask you as well was uh, that really you know education is, is you know just just get you know letting people know that these technologies exist and that uh, you know you can make yourself more vulnerable to coercion today um, by using these technologies so um, yeah I, I mean uh, um, you guys are doing great work um, there's uh, you know I've interviewed probably a, you know, a couple months worth of people who are doing really incredible things um, and uh, yeah I'm always happy to to try to uh, you know let people know about uh, uh, let People know about that extremely valuable work. So, um, I guess uh, Richard, uh, do you have any uh, close, other uh, closing thoughts for the listeners, sir? Uh, no, I thanks. I uh, thanks for uh, the kind words, and uh, I, I think what you're doing is great because it's it's also an example of decentralized communication. You know, decentralized uh, news, getting getting the word out. How you know how else would you find out about these projects if you didn't have people like you out there um, taking advantage of the technology to make to make things known to people. Uh, you mentioned uh, Keto Miner. I just wanted to say that we've also been in talks with them. They they talked about how you could um, put the Blockstream satellite on their Noddle device, mm-hmm. and um, we've also we're also in talks to see how we can also add mesh to that. We we were in Malta together at a conference, and we actually just did a little rough test, and it's definitely possible. So so your off gridders, I think you know that would be a good combination: the the Blockstream satellite, the the Noddle, and the Gotenna mesh. So. Look for that. Look for that combo coming soon. We hope. Yeah, the the noddle of it's yeah the noddle. It's one hell of a device. So it's really the only thing you need. Well, obviously you want to you want to <laughs> diversify the way that you hold your Bitcoin. But um, you know, like if if you you need a, you need a noddle, <laughs> and uh, yeah, you definitely need a noddle. So um, I guess uh, anything else, Richard? Uh, and uh, I'll, and feel free to uh, plug away as well. Any anything you'd uh, you like to plug for the listeners? Uh, no, I mean I, I think we covered it all. I've. Uh... I'm I'm excited to listen to your talk with Samurai because because uh, we've worked with those guys and they, they they're part of this equation too. So um, no, I I'm, I'm yeah I think I've said my said said what I know. <laughs> Great. And I just encourage people to please you know go to our website and and give us feedback. This is still pretty early. We're still building this out. So uh, especially if you're a developer and you you want to get involved, let us know. And uh, you know we need testers. We need people to review kind of what our what our plans are and. Give us feedback on that too, and tell us how we can make this make this work because we're we're dedicated to making this work. Awesome, great to hear. Well, uh, Richard, thank you so much for coming on, and uh, yeah, thanks to you, thanks for uh, all all of your uh, all of your work, and uh, also um, yeah, thanks to your th- thanks to your team too. Uh, it's it's extremely valuable. Um, it's uh, it definitely is, and it, it's something uh, especially in this high tech world that we live in. Um, for people who who pursue alternative lifestyles, whether van nomadism or living on a sailboat or just perpetual traveling, it's uh, really important that uh, um, there's software and hardware and technology available um, to suit uh, to suit those uh, those those lifestyles, and especially outside uh, the realm of uh, the first realm internet controls. So, um, thanks again, and uh, um, I'll uh, definitely uh, definitely uh, for you guys, the listeners, uh, check out uh, all the links in the show notes. Um, I'll uh, pro- they'll probably be a uh, pretty uh, probably be quite a few links there, so definitely do check those out. And uh, lastly, check out the website, uh, yeah, vonnypodcast.com. And uh, yeah, I think that's uh, I think that's it. Thanks for tuning in. And until next time, let's build the Agora and let's build Mesh Network Connected Second Realms. Building the Agora.
Here at the Vanu Podcast, we understand the importance of the Agora and recognize the necessity of supporting its traders. This section of the show is called Building the Agora, wherein we highlight great Agora's businesses, podcasts, or otherwise social operational media. First off is the parent tax applications. If you're looking for strategy guides, Agora's fiction, or other tools to build your freedom, you need to take a look at what we have to offer. Just visit libertandertack.com and take 10% off your order by using coupon code SELFLIBERATE. We also offer assistance to new authors in navigating the publishing process. From proofreading, editing your manuscript, to Kindle and paperback formatting, all the way to full audiobook production. We can help you with all of it. If that's a service you may be interested in, please visit libertandertack.com slash public. If you're like me, you may also enjoy starting your mornings off with a book and a delicious cup of coffee. Well, I've got good news for you. Jay Catano has a great business called Anarcho Coffee, and he's giving you a lifetime 10% discount code, LUA10. Head over to anarchocoffee.com and pick up a bag of Volunteers Valhalla, Rothbard Roast, or some merchandise. I personally drink Rothbard Roast most mornings, and it's absolutely delicious. Highly recommend. Again, that is anarchocoffee.com, and use LUA10 to take 10% off your order. I've often complained about the lack of self operational media. Hell, it's why my first podcast radio show focused on solutions and why this podcast exists. If you're sick of hearing libertarians bitch and complain all the time and instead want tools for your self-liberation, check out the Liberty Forge podcast hosted by my friends Kyle Turnblazer and Merrick Van Landingham. They cover all sorts of topics, and it's one of these shows I make time to listen to every single week. Check them out at thelibertyforge.com. Recently, I interviewed Dr. Michael Laufer from the Four Thieves Vinegar Collective. We talked about the importance of health when it comes to self-liberation. Well, our newest addition to the Building the Agora segments is Love Java. Our Age of Enlightenment runs on Love Java, the gateway to your health freedom. Have the ultimate superfood elixir anytime, anywhere with Love Java CBD-infused high-performance butter coffee concentrate packs. Liberty begins with N. Start every day with Love Java for breakfast and live free now. Like the Facebook page and check out lovejava.com, that's L-U-V, java.com for more info or you can private message them on facebook for any questions or to place your custom handcrafted order now again that is lovejava.com lastly is the enemy of the state's dank pod stash hosted by nick irwin and david valentine they have a really great podcast that i would definitely recommend in addition to a store with some incredible shirt designs you can find their work by visiting thedankpodstash.com again their site is thedankpodstash.com that's all for now. Make sure to check out the show notes for links to all of these great businesses and podcasts. Building Agora.